Hey ho, John Lee Dumas here of Entrepreneur on Fire, the number one business podcast, and you are listening to the How to Quit Working Show by Jeff Steinman, where you'll hear insights, stories, and inspiration from successful entrepreneurs who quit their job and started a business. Prepare to ignite. This is the How to Quit Working Show. Jeff Steinman believes entrepreneurship is the only true path to freedom. That's why he created the How to Quit Working Show, where you'll hear stories, insights, and inspiration from lifestyle fanatics who left their soul-sucking 9-to-5 job forever. Now, here's your host, author, entrepreneur, and ultimate lifestyle fanatic, Jeff Steinman. Hello and welcome to the How to Quit Working Show. I'm so excited about what we're going to talk about today. You know, I was I was in the shower the other day and uh, I was having a thought about a couple of different guests who had been on the show, and I noticed this kind of theme that ran through these three guests in particular. And the theme that I noticed was that not only were they very passionate about and very devoted to their business, and they were very excited about the financial results that they had gotten. They loved what they do. What what they do? They had um, they had uh, employees that they that they really enjoyed having a part of their business and and working with. And their businesses were very successful, but the thing that stood out for these three guests in particular is the degree to which their businesses were so helpful to so many different parties. Now, we talk a lot, in fact, in the How to Quit Now training, I spend a lot of time talking about figuring out, when you're looking at what your product or service is, figuring out how the hell that helps people. How does it actually help people to have a better life or a better something? But they take it a level further. And that's what I want to talk about today on today's show, is I want to talk about how do you take that whole idea of setting up a business that helps people and take it f- even further, even further beyond your uh, customer and how you help your customer and creating this business that is just nothing but this giant festival of helping people in all different sorts of ways. And that is why these three businesses that I'm uh, that stand out in my head as I reflect back on the nearly 150 uh, entrepreneurs that I've interviewed, that's what sticks out about these three in particular. And it's no coincidence that they are also three of the largest and most successful businesses that I've had on the show. So we're going to talk about that. And uh, coming up later in the show, Heather is going to talk about investment versus expense. So what is an expense? What is an investment? And how do you figure out which is which and when it's appropriate to do uh, one versus the other. So great, great, really like rolling up your sleeves, getting down into the down and dirty uh, stuff of starting a business later on. So that's going to be really good. Uh, But before we jump into any of it, I want to make sure that you know about our How to Quit Working group on Facebook. We call it the How to Quit Working Circle. You can get there by going to howtoquitworking.com slash group. And that will take you over to Facebook. And then what you'll do is you'll just click on join group. And that will take you right into the group. And then we will get your request approved as soon as possible. If you have people who you are Facebook friends with who you don't want them to know that you're in a group called How to Quit Working, don't worry about that at all because nobody can see it except the people in the group. Those are the only folks that can see that you're in the group. And those are the only people that can see that you joined the group. And those are the only people that can see what you post once you are in the group. So go to howtoquitworking.com slash group and jump into that great conversation. Get feedback on your ideas. Get other people to talk to, get input and uh, advice from Heather and myself, and uh, just have a blast because we have a blast in the How to Quit Working group on Facebook. I love I love going out there. I'm out there several times a day just seeing what folks are talking about and seeing if there's anything that I can do to help. And the other thing that I do out there very frequently is – I post ideas for shows. You know, the things that I talk about on this show are not just things that I dream up. <laughs> They're things that the community uh, of How to Quit Working uh, listeners and uh, fans and readers and clients and all of that folk, all of that whole group of people determines what 
uh, what we're going to talk about on the show, what kind of guests we're going to have on the show, and uh, we, the, the communication channel that we use for that uh, is basically the Facebook group. So go to howtoquitworking.com slash group and become a member of this community and start having some input into what we do on the show here and make some friends, get some feedback, and uh, maybe even make some business acquaintances out there. All right, now let's dive into the meat of the show. And 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 really what I want to focus on here is this whole idea of, okay, so let's start with the premise that we know that your product or service, whatever your business does, we know that that has to help someone, right? That has to help the client do something be something, get something, get rid of something, whatever that is, it has to it, it has to give them something that they want or maybe take something away that they don't want. It's all about helping people. And and when when you really are able to pull back and look at your business not from the standpoint of, ooh, I think this is a good idea. Ooh, I think this is cool. And by the way, I feel like when you're talking about a business or you're talking about a business idea and you use words like cool, that is, it's the death knell of a business. It, it, cool isn't what people want. People want something that's helpful. People want something that is transformational. When you say it's cool, it might be cool, right? There's a lot of cool things out there. There's a lot of I like little technology gadgets just as much as, as the next guy. And we, we know we've all had that conversation with our friends or or our colleagues about, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there was a little device that did this? You know, but why it why doesn't that exist? Well, it might not exist because it doesn't really help anybody in their life. It doesn't really help anybody to an extent that they're actually willing to pay money for, maybe not even a dollar, right? So Get the idea of cool out of your head and, and think about helping. How does it help people? And again, the more that you help people, the more that you transform their lives, the more money you charge, the more wealthy that you become, right? So when you think about one of the examples I always use is the coffee cup that doesn't tip over in your car. I don't know if they sell these things anymore, but back like in the 80s, they would have these coffee cups and it would flare out at the bottom. So the bottom would be almost twice as big as the top. So that just made it more stable so that it, you could set it down in the car and it wouldn't be as likely to tip over. So, um, you know, that adds value to someone's life. But how much value does it add? Well, you know, how much do you pay for those things? I, they're probably five, six, seven, ten bucks, something like that. You know, so you got to sell a lot of those. But when you think about so, so again, you always have to put into perspective, well, how much does that really help somebody? Yeah, that helps somebody. They can drink their coffee in their car and uh, the coffee cup won't tip over, or at least it isn't as likely to tip over. And that's great, but um, you know what's that really worth? Is that does that really change your life? Is that really life changing? No, nah, probably not. All right, um, you know one of the one of the reasons that um, we got into the business of helping people to quit their job and start a business is because uh, that's pretty transformational. That's a pretty huge thing. Uh, I don't want to be in the business of of um, just giving you a, a, a device that lets you drink coffee in your car. That doesn't get me excited. It's not big enough, right? And because of that, you know, how to quit working products and services are considerably more than $10. <laughs> you know, the, the lowest point of entry is the book, which is like 15 bucks, depending on where you buy it. But, but again, when you look at that, look at everything that you're thinking about doing, everything that you're considering doing from that, how much does it transform someone's life perspective? All right, then everything gets easier and your rate of success goes way up. So uh, with that as the premise, let's talk about how do we take that beyond just the customer. Now, let's talk about a, a couple of businesses. Let's talk about Pino's Palette. Now, Pino's Palette is one of the three that I was talking about. When I interviewed the founders of Pino's Palette, the thing that – they and, and this is now, Pino's Palette is a franchise, so uh, folks can open up Pino's Palette franchises in their area, and they're supported by the uh, the founders of the the franchise owners that, that I had on the show. Now, the thing that got them really excited when they started talking about, and you know, we talked about their journey. You know, they worked corporate jobs and they quit those jobs to start Pino's Palette, and then they looked at, well, how do we grow this thing? 
And the answer that came up, I guess, when they did their research and when they made their decision was the franchise model. They said, okay, the franchise is the way to go with this. So, uh, and, and just just really quick, for, for uh, let me just quickly explain what a franchise model is. I'm not an attorney, and this is just my understanding as a lay person. I've never done anything involving a franchise, so I don't have any expertise in it. Um, so this is kind of the Wikipedia definition of a franchise is uh, you, you have a business and you basically license out the name, the systems, and the processes, and sometimes even other pieces like customer service and what have you. You license that out to uh, to individual people who want to set up their own branch or piece of that business. Now, for example, McDonald's this is something that everybody's familiar with. Uh, McDonald's is a franchise, and basically, if you want to open a McDonald's, you don't just go open a McDonald's. You go to McDonald's corporate and you pay them a fee, a franchise fee, and then they, uh, you then get the advantage of their marketing. You get their processes. You get their systems. You get uh, the benefits of the advertising they're doing. Right. If I open up a McDonald's at the end of the block here, people know what McDonald's is. Right. So that's why I pay a lot of money to use that name. And also for the benefit of the national advertising that comes with McDonald's and their systems and their processes and you know the the layout plans for the stores, the uh, probably bulk rate on equipment and stuff. Actually, when I was in college, I worked for uh, a supplier of McDonald's, so the it was the uh, the local distribution hub where local McDonald's would call in to order. Everything that they need, everything from toilet paper in the bathroom to the hamburger patties to the buns and everything else. But what would happen was, uh, or, or what I learned from that situation was, I learned how stringent McDonald's is about how the franchisees must follow the processes and systems and procedures and use the products and services that the company provides. So they they give you all of that, right, and you pay for that. So. In other words, the way McDonald's grows is not by itself actually opening additional stores. It grows by partnering with other entrepreneurs who want to open stores using the McDonald's name. All right, so think of that conceptually. That's how a franchise works. And Pino's Palette is very similar. All right, so if you want to open a Pino's Palette in your area, you contact Pino's Palette, you pay them a fee, obviously, and uh, they provide you with a lot of resources. They provide you with a computer system to manage your your store. Uh, you get to use the name and, and, and kind of all that kind of stuff, and I don't know any of the details about how that works, but generally speaking, that's how it works. Now, to get back to my point, which is that we talked to the founders of Pino's Palette about how you know, they left their jobs. They started this business. They decided that the franchise model was for them. And the thing that brought them so much joy is the degree to which they were able to help other people leave their jobs and pursue their dreams and have the amazing entrepreneurial lifestyle that they have. So they 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 were so excited about the fact that they had created this opportunity for other people to create their own businesses that lets them have everything that they want out of life, which the founders had previously gotten for themselves. You know, and, and it's, it goes back to one of the things that that I've seen after interviewing all of these entrepreneurs is that as soon as somebody has a certain degree of success, their motivation shifts from wanting to have more success for themselves and certainly they want that everybody wants to grow and get bigger and get better but there's this huge desire to help other people to have that degree of success and uh, I think it's so fascinating when and so hugely beneficial when um, when you create a business that helps multiple people on multiple levels so Pino's palette, Let's let's just run through all the people that are helped when a Pino's Palette when a new Pino's Palette franchise is opened, right? So the 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 founders, the creators of Pino's Palette, the franchisor, they're helped because they get more revenue into their business. They get the fees. 
They get to uh, widen their footprint. They get the increased uh, reach of their brand into that new local market. The franchisees, so the people that open up a new Pinot's palette in a new city, they get the advantage of now having their own business and not only having their own business, but having their own business uh, that they didn't have to figure out a lot of the processes and systems. They didn't have to figure out a lot of the marketing. Now, it's not to say there isn't still a ton of work in opening a franchise, but a lot of that stuff is done for them. Right? So they get all of that benefit. They now get to become entrepreneurs and they get to leave their corporate jobs and they get to pursue their dream. And they get the satisfaction of creating this really neat experience for folks because if you're not familiar with, with what Pinot's palette is. If you're in the U.S., there's probably uh, a location near you. And you know, check out their website and see the, the really cool uh, 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 parties that you can do there where you get to drink wine and uh, you get to do a little bit of art and you get to have fun. You know, so they get to create this. They get to create this amazing space where people can come and enjoy themselves and have fun. And uh, it's it's such a it's such a cool thing. But so so again, we're looking at all of the people that are that are helped along the way. We've got the franchisor so far. We've got the franchisee. We've got the customers. Of course, that goes without saying. Not only does the franchisor or, or the you know the Pinot's Palette kind of headquarters corporate kind of a arm. Uh, have employees, but each one of the stores has employees, right? So then each one of the franchises that are opened up then have employees that come in and uh, now have jobs because of this, right? So, and then let's also back up and say, well, the people that open the franchise, well, they're no longer working their corporate jobs. So now we've done a good thing for the unemployment rate because we've pulled them out of the employment pool. We've freed up a spot at their company for somebody who maybe doesn't have a job to slip into. And so I, I hope you see what I'm saying here and that it's just, it's benefit on top of benefit on top of benefit on top of benefit. And I'm not talking just about uh, franchises here because I think that was, that was an important aspect. Uh, and, and it's an important thing to, it's an important option to keep on the, keep on the table. And, and cause it's not right for everybody, whether it's from a franchisor or a franchisee standpoint, it's not right for everybody, but it is important to remember that that is one legal structure here in the U S and I know it exists in other countries, it probably has different names and whatnot uh, outside the U.S. But you know, the idea is that uh, uh, it's it's another way to start a business that you should keep uh, on the table and, and always remember that that is an, an option. So, um, but but look at how much that model is able to help so many people in so many different ways. And I'm, for, you know, I, I'm leaving out tons of them. I'm leaving out the suppliers, right? The people that supply the the wine, the art supplies, the flooring, the people who clean the buildings that the Pinot Palette franchises are in, right? All these people are getting jobs. They're getting economic benefit. It just goes on and on and on. We could never, you know, we could never on this one podcast, we could never list out all of the people that benefit from a Pinot's Palette franchise. I mean, just it, it just goes on and on and on. And my point here is just remember when you're putting together your business model and you're thinking about what kind of business to start, think about all the people along the way that you're helping and how many people that you're helping in so many different ways. And when you're when you're early on in your business, there's not going to be as many, right? I mean, as your business grows, the number of people that you help will grow. But keep that in mind, right? Because it's, it may, may only be a handful of people to, be, to begin with, but I promise you it's more than just your client. It's more than just your customer that your business is helping. So get creative and think about that because what that's going to do is that's going to energize you because one of the things that we forget about, we completely forget about this in, in our day-to-day -day conversation is that as human beings, we have a lot of desire to help other people. We love helping other people. And that's a really huge motivator for us. No matter who we are or where we're at in in our journey, how much money we have, how broke we are, how rich we are, whatever it may be, that it, we love to help other people. And it's important to keep that in mind as a motivator because it's a much better motivator than money because money's really kind of a crappy motivator. It just really doesn't motivate people enough. Now, some people it does. I think some people 
are very money driven. I think those are a, it's a very small sliver uh, of the overall uh, population of the world, but those people are out there and maybe money is enough of a motivator for you. But I think for a vast majority of folks, money is just not a big enough motivator. So think about all the other people that you can help. Now I want to talk about a couple of other folks who've also been on the show who uh, I think have, uh, who, who really um, take on this, this idea of helping so many other people. The other one is uh, Terry Galt, the founder of um, uh, the grocery game.com. Now let's just talk, let's just start talking about all the people that her business helps. So number one, it helps her obviously, right? It's helped her to become successful. It's helped her to live her dream. It helps her to have everything that she wants in life. She employs a number of her family members. So, which a lot of people would say, don't ever do that. Terry says, nope, it works just fine if you do it right. And good for her. She's figured out a way to make that work. So it helps her. It helps a number of her family members. She has, uh, I think her nephew doing some work. Her sister is, is the operations manager, and she rattled, her husband's involved in the business, right? So um, a number of people in her family are involved with the business. So it helps her, helps her family, helps her customers. Now, this is the cool thing about the grocerygame.com. When you go to the grocerygame.com, what does the website do? It helps you save money on your groceries. Well, how cool is that? You know, I mean, who doesn't need some help saving money on on your on their groceries? I don't know, you know, what the prices are or how the pricing works on the website, but it wouldn't work if it didn't help you save more money than you pay, right? To be a member or or to get onto the website. So, um, all of that. Now, the grocery game is also a franchise model. So, when uh, Terry wants to enter an additional market. An additional uh, region of the country, additional city, or you know, however it's divided up. I don't know the details of that. It doesn't matter. But when she wants to go into a new area, she finds a franchisee. She finds somebody who wants to set up the grocery game in St. Louis, or the grocery game in Washington D.C., or the grocery game in Gary, Indiana, or wherever it may be. Then. Just like with Pino's Palette, she's given another person, another entrepreneur, and the ability to open up their own grocery game franchise and get all of those same benefits, right? And then what happens? Here we go again. Then the French, the French, the local franchisee then needs help, so they begin using services. Maybe they use uh, uh, staffing services in their local area. Maybe they hire people in their local area. And then they bring the benefit of being able to save money on your groceries to St. Louis or to Gary, Indiana, or to wherever that local market is. So again, you see, and, and we can go on and on and on. And then again, somebody has to clean that office in Gary, Indiana, right? And 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 then we've employed someone else there, and you know, then we've 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 created uh, income for someone who owns a, a building in Gary, Indiana. If you know, if that place has a physical presence, right? So again, on and on and on with benefits and I call out the uh, so far Pino's palette and uh, and Terry of the grocery game because they just brought a lot of passion and energy uh, around the people that they actually are able to help and serve with their business so you see how it goes on and on and on and again with the grocery game we didn't even scratch the surface of the number of people that that are helped by that business so let's uh, go on to the third one that I want to sort of call out and the third one is uh, Amy and Terry uh, of uh, the who have the the pet grooming business. So uh, they have this amazing business. Now it's not a franchise model, but one of the things that when when I talked to them, when I interviewed them, I think their interview aired uh, maybe two or three weeks ago. But when I talked to them, one of the things that they were the most fired up about, that they were the most excited about, and that they felt the most responsibility about was this whole idea that they're creating a livelihood for a lot of people, for their employees. They've structured their business in such a way that employees can come and work for them and they can do it in a very flexible way. So it works really well. Now they, you know, they, they do pet sitting is one of the services that they offer. So they go into people's homes uh, while they're out of town and, and feed their dogs, feed their cats, walk their walk the dogs, 
play with the dogs, do whatever they got to do to to care for the pets. And that's something that can be done on a rather flexible schedule, S- somewhat flexible. I mean, obviously dogs have to pee when they have to pee, but you know, <laughs> there's some degree of flexibility there. So what, as they were explaining on the show, is that opens up a, a lot of options for working mothers, right? So working mothers, they can get the kids off to the school, off to school, and then they can do some pet sitting during the day and then be done by the time it's time to, to pick the kids up you know, and then be done and be able to get back to family life in the evening. Uh, retired people who don't want to work full time are able to participate in this and, and, and able to, um, to earn some extra money on the side. And, you know, they, they took a tremendous amount of pride in that. And they, they really felt, um, they felt very proud and they felt a, a huge sense of responsibility to the people that they employ in their company. And the other thing about uh, Amy and Terry that was so amazing was the degree to which they they really want to make their clients just feel better. They want to make their clients not have to worry about the dog when they go out of town because they know how much we love our pets. They know that we worry about our pets, and they want to take that worry away. And uh, so, so again, they, when you, let's let's back up and look at all the people that are helped in Amy and Terry's business. There, it starts with with them, of course. They 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 were walking their dogs one night, and they said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we could quit our corporate jobs that we don't really like and start a business doing this? And it turned into the huge multi-million dollar business that it is today. So they certainly were helped. Their families were helped. Their uh, clients are helped in that they're now able to go on vacation and not have to worry about the dog, not have to worry about the cat, not have to worry about anything. And they're able to get away uh, without having any of that stress that they previously would have had. And then uh, finally, they're able to help people who... uh, who work for them, people who uh, need extra money and maybe need to do that in a flexible kind of a way. And uh, they're able to provide that service that allows them to do that. So, and again, with, you know, with Amy and Terry's business, we just scratched the surface. We did not even dig into um, all of the ancillary because it goes on and on and on and on. So my point is think about how many people your business can help. And if you design that business in such a way that it can help as many people as humanly possible, you will be as successful as you can ever imagine. So the more people you can help, the more successful you can be. And don't stop at your customers. Think about all the other people that can be helped, how the community can be helped. We didn't even talk about communities, right? And how these businesses help communities, right? We could go on and I I feel like I have to stop. You just have to stop, Jeff, because you're just going to keep going on and on because this is an endless kind of a thing. So anyway, now I'm going to force myself to stop talking about that. That was a fun topic to talk about, but let's jump into our weekly segment with Heather. Heather is going to talk about investment versus expense. Heather, take it away. Hello, Freedom Fanatics. This is Heather Osgood, and I am so happy to be with you today. Whether you are driving in your car, whether you're working at home, whether you are at the office, or whether you are out in your garden, wherever you are and wherever you're listening to this, I hope that things are going well for you. And I hope that um, hearing our message of really just hope and really helping you further your dream will be something that just really resonates with you today. And I want to talk a little bit about the difference between what an expense is and what an investment is. Now, obviously, you know, when we think of an expense, we all think of a cost. And whether you're a business owner or whether you are just a homeowner or whether you're a renter, whether you're just a person living, um, all of us have bills, all of us have expenses, um, things that we have to pay every month or things that we have to pay every day. And um, if you don't currently have a business, most of the time, the things that you are spending are just pure expenses. They're really not investments of any sort. And when you have a business, there are lots of opportunities to make investments as opposed to just having expenses. So I wanna talk a little bit about what the 
differences between an expense and between an investment. And especially if you're not a business owner, just kind of shed some light on what that can mean for you. If you're listening to this podcast, you want to quit your job, you're ready to say goodbye to having a boss breathing down your neck, and you're ready to say hello to freedom. You're ready to really just receive some information about how you can change your life and how you can improve your life. And that can all start with an expense or an investment. Now, when I was in my early 20s, I got my first kind of real job in advertising sales, and I was working in radio ad sales. And at the time, I did the math, I was bringing home probably about $1,500 a month. And, you know, that's obviously been several years ago. Um, But I thought that I was doing pretty well. You know, $1,500 a month was the most I had ever made, and I was pretty happy with that. And as I got further into the process, um, I was so lucky to have received really great sales training at that job. And now I look back and I realize how great the training really was and how it set the foundation and created a structure for me to really propel myself into my career and really built some very solid sales training and sales experience in me, which I really value. And one of the things that they talked about was they talked about making an investment. And I always thought that that was really weird to me. I I didn't really know very much about business or really anything about business. And so as we're going through all of the different, you know, options of, you know, what the client might be able to to buy, I would say, so what does this one cost? And what does that one cost? And one of the training tips that I received was that you should never, ever refer to this as a cost because it's not a cost for the business. It's an investment for the business. Now, along with kind of that tip, I received many, many tips about how um, what I said could change the way someone acted and really could make them either decide to buy or not buy. And when I talk to this, these business owners, almost without exception, people would say, well, how much does it cost? That's kind of the word. That's, that's what always comes out of people's mouths. When you're talking to them about purchasing anything, the first thought that comes to everyone's mind, I think, is how much does it cost? And the cost is always such a big factor. And what I learn is that cost is only a really big factor if you haven't built any value. If they see that there's value in it and they see that they can make this purchasing decision um, and it's going to add value to their business, then they really don't look at it as a cost anymore. They look at it as as an investment. Now, as I began getting started in my first month, my second month, within like the first three to six months, I still really was struggling with it. I had these business owners, I was going in and I was asking them to spend easily $1,000, if not more than $1,000. I think the cheapest package I ever sold was 500, and that really wasn't a great package. Really, you needed to sell them at $1,000 or above. And I just kept thinking, that is so much money. No wonder people are saying no to me. No wonder people aren't buying from me. $1,000 is a ton of money. And the reason $1,000 was a ton of money to me was because I was bringing home $1,500. So in my mind, I'm thinking, why in the world would someone give me almost more than my monthly income. Like, you know, why would they do that? It didn't seem like really a smart choice to me. And that was a real stumbling block. And so one day I was in talking to my manager And we were just talking about costs of things and how when I would try to sell someone, people always really objected to how much the advertising cost. And he said, he goes, Heather, this is an investment for their business. If they spend $1,000 with you, they shouldn't get $1,000 back. They should get more than $1,000 back. So it wasn't as though they were just giving me money that was going to just disappear and not come back to them. It was money that they were giving as an investment with a return. He gave me an analogy that has stuck with me to this day. He said, you would probably never go out and spend $1,000 on t-shirts. It just wouldn't be something you would ever do. But a business owner may go out and they may spend $2,000 on t-shirts. They may have their logos printed all over them. They may give them out to their clients. And it could be a huge promotional opportunity for them to get new clients into their business. You can't look at an expense from a personal income 
and an expense from a business in the same way. Most individuals do not have investments that they can make besides your personal, possibly retirement account, or if you are obviously investing in the stock market, those are investments that you're making. And the reason that they're investments is because the idea, the hope is that that thousand dollars that you may invest in the stock market isn't going to be returned to you as a thousand dollars. It's going to be returned to you as a lot more than a thousand dollars. And so there are a few obviously opportunities as an individual to invest. But every day in your day-to-day life, when you go out and you buy clothes, when you go out and buy a new couch, if you um, decide that you want to you know, maybe buy a new car, those aren't investments, those are expenses for you. The only investments, like I said, that you could make are in the stock market, maybe um, redoing something in your house, putting on a new roof, maybe getting new siding. That is an investment in your home because that money is going to be returned to you. So it's really important when you're thinking about money going out, what category are you putting it in? And if you're not a business owner, chances are you maybe aren't thinking about expenses as investments. You're thinking of them as expenses. And I'll go into exactly what I mean by that in just just a minute here. The other um, analogy or, or story that I wanted to share with you today was my gym membership. Now, I have been working out for a little over a year now, and I am just absolutely addicted to it. And all of this came about because at the beginning of 2014, I decided that I really wanted to get in shape. I'm getting on toward 40 and I'm like, okay, this is it. If I'm ever going to be in shape, now is the time. I have to jump in and do something. I had had a gym membership at our local gym for many months. I think actually, I think it was about three years that I had the membership and we paid $75 a month and it was a membership for myself and my husband. And we never, ever went to the gym. As many Americans do, we signed up for a gym membership. We really weren't that happy with the gym. We weren't really happy with the classes that were offered. And we just never went. We would go a couple times, you know, we went a couple times, you know, late at night and walked on, ran on the treadmill. And, you know, it just didn't really ring my bell. I didn't really love it. And I'd obviously had that experience in the past where I had joined gyms. I've joined gyms where I went one time and I had a membership for years and went one time. So I decided now was the the year, 2014 was the year I was going to make a change in my life. And so I decided that I was going to cancel the gym membership and I was going to get a personal trainer. Now, in my mind, I was thinking, I'm paying $75 a month for a gym membership for two of us. I should be able to pay about $100 a month for a personal trainer for myself, even if I just work out a couple times a month, if the personal trainer can tell me exactly what to do and kind of create a roadmap for me to success, that'll be great. So I live in a relatively small town, not a whole lot of choices here, but there was a gym that I knew of that you know, specialized in personal training. And so I made an appointment and I went down and I talked to uh, the owner about the, the options that were available. And I was absolutely shocked at the cost. I had no idea how much it would be. And what he said was he said, well, I don't really think you need personal training, which I was a little disappointed in because I kind of wanted personal training. He said, I think you need this group fitness program. And it's only $179 a month. And I just about passed out. I was like, I can't justify going from spending $75 a month on a gym membership to $179 a month. To me, I just thought it was crazy. So I very quickly just dismissed the whole idea that it was even going to happen. And I kind of decided that was way more than I wanted to spend. And then I got home and I got thinking about it. And I was like, you know what? If I want to make a change, I just need to make a change. It felt like a ton of money to me to make a commitment. I mean, spending almost um, $2,000 a month or a year on a gym membership seemed totally crazy to me. But I decided to go ahead and jump in and and do it. And my husband was very supportive of the idea, which was certainly helpful. And I decided to do it. And so I signed up for the gym membership and I was very gung ho and I went for the first, you know, couple weeks. I think like the first month I was pretty consistent. I started out um, going two times a week and then he recommended I go to three times a week. And so I was doing it and then I got really tired. I was tired of going. I was tired of putting on my exercise clothes and, you know, the whole routine of having to stop what I was doing to go to the gym. Um, Frequently, the classes were offered at in the evening 
evenings at like 5.30. So I was having to kind of, you know, really motivate myself to get up and get going to the gym. And I remember very distinctly one day saying, you know what? I just don't want to go. I'm not going to go. It was like four weeks into it. And I thought, I'm over this. I don't really want to do it anymore. It's a lot of hard work. And I don't think I really want to put that much work in into the whole process. And then all of a sudden it occurred to me, Heather, you are paying $179 a month. You get yourself up, you put your gym clothes on, and you go to the gym. You cannot take $179 of your family's money and just totally waste it. And it was a huge turning point for me. It put pushed me to keep going to the gym. And it was so, so pivotal in my experience that I know I will never forget it. Because what I was paying for the gym was so painful that I had to go. And I am so thankful for it because I I persevered, I went and I kept going. And now I am here a, a year later and my goal is to go to the gym five days a week And I've switched to CrossFit and it's really intense and I'm really sore right now because I've been working out like crazy, but I absolutely love it. And that investment of $179 a month that I felt like was kind of just an insurmountable amount of money. And truthfully, it wasn't even that I didn't have the money. It just seemed like too much to spend, but I did it and it made a huge difference in my relationship to working out. I know that I would never have ever gotten to that level had the pain of that payment not been so great. And so really, at the end of the day, that $179 has been a huge investment. It was an investment in me. It was an investment in my ability to do what I needed to do to really reach that goal. And so I just want to bring it around to you right now. And I want you to really think about where you're at in your life. If you're at a place where you really are serious about quitting your job and starting a business, you really need to examine the steps that you're taking and the investments that you're making in creating this business. I know many of you have a desire to just bootstrap your company to really start something with not a whole lot, and I encourage you to do that. I am a strong believer that you do not need to go out and get an SBA loan for $500,000 or even $100,000 to start a business. You don't need to go find an angel investor. You don't need to go you know, collect money from all of your relatives. There is a lot you can do with your own ingenuity, with a computer, with a brain, and a lot of action. And so I do encourage you to do that. But there are investments that you need to make. There are investments of your time and there are investments of your money. And if you really think about what is an investment and what is an expense, what is going to return itself back to you? I could pay thousands and thousands of dollars in medical bills in my future or I can get in shape. And being in shape is going to help me not have thousands and thousands of dollars in medical bills. And hopefully it's going to help me live longer. It's going to give me more stamina. It's going to make me feel better every day in every way because I got up and went to the gym at 6 a.m. this morning. That is an investment that I'm making in myself. And in the same way, I want you to really examine the investments that you're making in your business. Where is your commitment level? Where is your desire to really get out there and say, I'm going to make this happen? Whether that be hiring a personal coach, whether that be getting the technology and the computers that you need, maybe the software that you need to make something happen, whether it be really investing in the right kind of inventory or the right product development, somewhere along the way, there is going to be an investment that you need to make in yourself and in your business. So I want you to encourage, I I want to encourage you to just examine every dollar, every proposal that comes at you and really think about how is this going to return itself to me? And will this money come back to me? Not only return in full, but also beyond that. There are lots and lots of investments that you can make to really propel yourself to the next level. So get out there and really examine what you're doing. Take that leap of faith. And I look forward to talking to you very soon. Great advice from Heather as always. Thank you, Heather. Now, if you are 
If you thought that was helpful and you'd like to have someone with that level of knowledge and expertise about business guiding you along the way and helping you to start your business and being there and telling you what to watch out for, what to do, what to not do, go to howtoquitworking.com slash coaching and get more information about coaching. See if there's something that we can do because that's kind of what we do here. We help people quit their jobs and start a business. And uh, sometimes that is more than just listening to a podcast or reading a blog. So go to howtoquitworking.co.com slash coaching and get more information about coaching. And guess what's going to happen next time? We're going to talk to another amazing entrepreneur just like you who's quit their job and started a business. So until then. Thanks for joining us on the How to Quit Working Show. Tune in next time when we'll talk to another amazing person just like you who is now living the ultimate life of freedom and doing it on their terms. If you want to learn how to quit working and get these episodes delivered directly to you, visit howtoquitworkingshow.com.